Welcome to Patrick Henry College and to our Newsmaker interview series. My name is Graham Walker, president of the college, and we're delighted to welcome you to this, uh, this incredible series of interviews uh, by Dr. Marvin Olasky. As you know, uh, we are very privileged to have Dr. Olasky as a member of our faculty. He is the holder of our distinguished chair in journalism and public policy, and also, of course, as you probably know even better, the editor-in-chief of World Magazine. Uh, he is an accomplished scholar and teacher and journalist himself. He's authored more than 20 books and hundreds of articles for national publications. Marvin Olasky is a national voice for a Christian analysis of media, history, arts, culture, the sanctity of life, and myriad other issues. He's a friend of President George W. Bush, uh, who called him compassionate conservatism's leading thinker. And I'm so grateful to have you here, Marvin, because all of your analysis is infused by your commitment to the Bible as the inerrant word of God, which I think is what gives your work such power. And today, uh, we have the privilege of listening to you interview uh, author Richard Platt. Welcome, Mr. Platt. Thank you. I understand that you came to professional writing uh, in your life in the early 40s, but you, you say that your love of the music of language has been part of your life for a long time. As a contributor to the Literary Quarterly Slightly Foxed, Mr. Platt earned critical praise for his one-man play, Ripples from Walden Pond, An Evening with Henry David Thoreau. He studied and volunteered at the Kills, C.S. Lewis's former home in Oxford, and his new book, As One Devil to Another, is a modern-day sequel to C.S. Lewis's Screwtape Letters. None other than the leading C.S. Lewis expert, Walter Hooper, has been quoted as saying, it reads as if Lewis himself had written it. In this modern updating of Lewis's classic, which I'm sure we'll learn much more about in a few moments, a series of letters between devils reveal a starkly accurate perspective on how issues such as contemporary technology and sexual mores are infused into the spiritual battle being waged against believers. I understand that the book weaves together timeless issues such as the power of prayer, the purpose of suffering, and promises held up by heaven and threats held up by hell. I, for one, am eager to hear more, so please join me in giving Richard Platt a warm welcome. Thank you. Now, Richard, I know you don't really want to talk about yourself a lot, but you did tell me, wrote to me, that you spent six years at a loathsome prep school that specialized in teaching worldly ambition and hubris. That's a very C.S. Lewis-like comment, <laughs> uh, uh, thinking of Eustace Scrub, for example. Uh, how did you survive those six years? Badly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, looking back on that time now, I realized that was an, an incomparable gift. I didn't know it then. I just knew that I was miserable there then. But I realized that they managed to teach me all the things that I didn't want to be and all the things that I didn't want my life to be about. And so I had nightmares about being there for years, a long time after leaving. But now, looking back, it's, it's interesting. There's this, uh, this idea in Kierkegaard that you can only live your life forward, but you don't under understand it looking back. And so looking back on that time, I realized that God had spent those six years beating the ego out of me. Because when, when you go to a school like that, it's, the entrance is through competitive examination. And when I was in the public school system, I was used to thinking of myself as a pretty bright kid. And I was a pretty bright kid. In most classes, there, I would be one of the two or three smarter kids in the class. But when you go to a school like that, every kid there was one of the smartest kids in the class. And you realize that there are a whole lot of people in this world that are smarter than you are and more capable. And so that's really a good thing to learn. And the, the competitive friction of that school was such that, that the work was so hard for me to keep up with people that were more capable than I was, that it was, it was an extraordinary experience. When I, when I left, I realized that I wasn't as smart as I thought I was, and that's a really good thing for a young man to learn. And so then you uh, went to several colleges, uh, preferred, it seems, real life rather than academic life, and got involved in the restaurant business and started moving up. Tell us about that whole experience in, in restaurants. Well, I just, I realized in the college experience, I wasn't finding the right fit. I wasn't finding the career path that spoke to me. There were, in those days, we thought that there were two kinds of career paths, the career path for the things that you love and the career path for the things that you can make a living at. And I tried to major in business twice, and both times I decided I'd rather jump off a bridge 
than major in business, but I still had to make a living. And so I started working in the restaurant business at night, like most people that go to college and have to pay their own way and have to feed themselves. And that was just something that I learned how to do. And it wasn't something that I was in love with, but it was something that I was reasonably good at. There are four or five personality traits, four or five um, skills that you need to work in that kind of a business. And it just so happens that I have them. And so it was a good fit in that way. And so it was, it was an acceptable way to make a living. And the great thing about it was that for me as a student, my greatest, um, uh, I think my most enriching and most rewarding years have been my autodidact years. And working in the restaurant business, it's not the kind of business that, that demands all of your brain. It's not like, say, being an attorney where you've got to spend 70 hours a week using your brain and then you get home and you're exhausted. The restaurant business is physically fatiguing, but it's not mentally fatiguing. And so again, the incomparable gift, I didn't know this then, I know it now, by having a career path like that, not really a career path, just something that I was able to eat, uh, I could get home every day and I could be physically tired, but I had something left. And so I could sit down and read. And all the writers that I have come to revere and love, I have discovered after college. Dr. Johnson, uh, G.K. Chesterton, C.S. Lewis, those people, those are all people that I had to discover on my own. And because of the work that I've had, I've been able to indulge my preferences. And I've spent the last 30, 35 years reading. And it's been a wonderfully productive time for me. And then you also, uh, I understand, uh, bought a house by the ocean in San Diego and wasn't much of a house at first. And so no. that's been another of your enterprises over the years. Right. It, well, it still isn't much of a house. Okay. It's, just, it's just a much nicer house than it used to be. Uh, it's quite small, but there are only two of us. Um, our house is about 1,300 square feet, and 400 square feet of it is devoted to book storage. Okay. <laughs> All right. So we have, we have about 5,000 books in our house, which uh, fill 500 linear feet of shelving. And so when we bought the house, I, I didn't know which end of the screwdriver to hold, and, but I found out that people that do know which end of the screwdriver to hold charge 40 or $45 an hour for their time, and so I thought, well, I need to learn how to do this. So. 22 years later, I had a habitable house. <laughs> right. And you've been married now, I take it, for 30 years. We just celebrated our 30th anniversary. Uh, easily the smartest thing I've ever done in my entire life. Right. I, I married the most extraordinary woman and uh, the great blessing. I've never done anything smarter. Well, I feel the same way about, uh, about my uh, marriage and so forth. Uh, uh, although, to a certain extent, I don't, I don't really feel that I chose that. No, not at all. So, no, it, was just, it just came by grace. Right. So didn't we luck out on that one? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so your wife, with all those books, your wife must be either hugely indulgent or she may have the same taste as you have? My wife is very indulgent. Okay. Yes, one, one, of the, one, one, of the, one of the standard jokes in our house is I, I describe myself as low maintenance. <laughs> and, and my wife will say, oh yeah, you're low maintenance. We just had to build a room on the back of the house to hold all your books and you know, 5,000 5, books later, you're, you're a low maintenance guy. And I say to her, well, and this, this is a conversation we've had many times, so it's almost like, like a play where we both know our part. And, uh, and then I say to her, well, it's, you know, we look at all the books in the room and I say to her, well, it's, it's cheaper than a cocaine habit or a girlfriend. <laughs> and she says, well, I'm not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> and so, but uh, so you're working in the restaurant business and moving up to managing and so forth and doing quite well there. Uh, you're reading a lot. And at a certain point, you decide to start writing. Perhaps you could tell us about the, the moment you actually realized you were a writer and could have something published. Right. Well, a, a publication, I, it, it, I didn't even think that quite that far ahead. I just felt the impetus to write. Um, three events converged at the same time. Uh, the first was that I had been reading the New York Times Book Review since I was a teenager. And I noticed over a period of time that the kind of books that the Times was reviewing had begun to deteriorate. Uh, there was a time when they started doing reviews of uh, celebrity biographies and biographies of Princess Diana, and, and then they'd start in the, doing reviews of best-selling authors. They'd do like the, the Tom Clancy's and the Stephen King's of the world. And not that I, I have anything against those kind of writers. They're, they're entertainers and they do what they do brilliantly, but the point is that the New York Times is one of the most influential book review publications in America, and I think that as with that kind of power, they have an obligation to review books that need reviewing. When Stephen King publishes a new book, if everybody hates it or everybody loves it, it's still gonna sell. So he doesn't need to be in the Times. And the math is such that every time the Times reviews a book, there is no space for 20 other books 
which are worthy of being reviewed and which will not be reviewed and will probably die without the support of the Times. So I felt that they had an obligation and they weren't fulfilling that obligation. The second thing that happened was, about that time I heard about this new book review journal, Slightly Foxed, uh, which is based in London. And their mission is to tell you about good books that you don't know about or that you might have known about and forgotten about and you might want to revisit. There's no agenda, there's no politics. It could be a book that was written last year, 10 years ago, 100 years ago, makes no difference. As long as it has a certain quality of narrative voice or it has a certain literary value, it's a book they want you to know about. So I got a copy of their publication and I thought, this is good, this is what a book review journal should be. So th I'll start reading this. And then the third thing that happened was, at that time, I discovered Wendell Berry, who I now know is one of the great men of letters that America has produced in the last 50 years, but I didn't know it then. And so a very dear friend of mine, uh, incidentally the friend who also introduced me to C.S. Lewis, introduced me to Wendell Berry. So as you can imagine, my debt to him is very great. And so he placed Wendell Berry's novel, Jaber Crow, in my hands. I took it home and read it, and it just knocked me out. And I thought, how come I didn't know? How come no one told me? Why did it take me so long to know about this? And so these three things converged. And I picked up the Slightly Fox and I thought, I want to be a part of this. I want to, I want to contribute to what they're doing, because what they're doing here is good. In, a, in its very small way, they're not curing cancer or anything, but what they're doing is good and it's pure and it speaks to me. So I decided I would write a review of Jaber Crow, and I sent it to the publishers with a cover letter and a copy of the book, and I basically said, I love what you're doing and I'd like to be part of this. Can I help in this venture? And if I can't, that's fine. Count me a subscriber anyway, but I'd like to contribute. So I sent that off in the mail and I forgot about it. And about four or six weeks later, I got an envelope in the mail with the return address slightly foxed. And I looked at it and I thought, oh, it's a bill. And then I thought, no, it's not a bill because I paid for this over the phone with a Visa card. Oh, I know what this is. This is either an acceptance or it's a rejection. And it wasn't until that moment, that was the moment when I held the envelope in my hands, I thought, I really want this. I really want to do this very badly. And then I opened the envelope and it was an acceptance. It was, dear sir, thanks for sending this. We love what you've done. Um, oh, by the way, we do pay our contributors. That was a revelation. And, uh, and then at the bottom it said, do let us know if you'd like to write for us again. Well, I didn't need a second invitation for that. And so I've been writing for them ever since. And at a certain point there was a letter, an envelope with a check in it? Well, actually what I've done over the years is I, I still have not received a check. I, <laughs> as, as I say, I put my money back into the firm. Okay. All right. And so whenever they, whenever they in fact, the, the very first time, is very, a very funny story about this. Uh, usually I just say to them, keep the money and send me some extra copies that I can give to friends or this kind of thing. And so the very first time when they were going to pay me, they didn't have a US dollar bank account. And so it's difficult to write somebody a check in English pounds and then there's the exchange rate and all that. And so there's a bookshop in London, one of my favorite bookshops called Haywood Hill, which is, uh, I, I've been going to London a, a lot over the years because I have friends who live there. And so the editor sent me a note and she said, uh, well, we don't have a, a US dollar bank account. Uh, and so perhaps I should just credit your account at <laughs> Haywood Hill. Yes. And that's what they did. So they sent yeah. the check to the bookstore. And then whenever I go to town, I've got, I've got money on account. <laughs> oh, very, cool. very cool. So, so note the process here. Um, there are years and years and years in the making of this book. I, I get letters occasionally from young journalists and they want to be foreign correspondents. <laughs> uh, and the way to do that is first you report in cities and you cover fires and, and shoplifting and other things and then gradually you learn how to do this. Um, in writing, a lot of people, especially now that you can self-publish so easily, a lot of people want to write a book at first, but you had years of reading, following, followed by writing reviews, so you had to start to really discern what works in the book and what doesn't work in the book. Mm -hmm. And then finally, at the end of this long process, we have this book that has just come out, As One Devil to Another, and 
Yes, I, I read a, uh, an advanced copy of this about a month ago and, and thought this is pretty cool because most of you here, I suspect, have read screw tape letters at some point and you may know that there have been lots and lots of attempts to write sequels to it, to follow, follow up. There was one in 1975, I recall. Uh, there have been others mm -hmm. and it's hard to do. Uh, and, and I think Richard here pulls it off, which is why I, I said, okay, why don't you come out here? And Richard was kind enough to come here from San Diego and you'll be flying back this afternoon because you actually have a play that you've written premiering tonight I do. in San Diego. Yes. So tell us about the play, and then we'll come for the briefly, and then we'll come back to the book. Sure. The uh, the play is a, a one man show, Ripples from Walden Pond, an evening with Henry David Thoreau. Uh, it's been five years in the making, and it has its world premiere tonight at San Diego's Signet Theater, 7:30 curtain. My plane arrives at six. Okay. So plane I arrives at six. Head out to the theater. Go directly to the theater. All right. Yes. All right. Well, wish you Godspeed on that. No, Thank you very no much. Worries. So now the book. Uh, first of all, um, when did you first encounter the screw tape letters, and why did you fall in love with it, and then why did you write this? I'll give you a three-barreled um, question. Right. Uh, the well, the, the I don't remember exactly when I encountered the screw tape letters. I, en I encountered Lewis in the way other people encounter an avalanche. Okay. Um, and so the first book of Lewis's I read was Surprised by Joy, introduced to me by the friend who gave me Jaber Crow, uh, who was also a Presbyterian minister. And we had gotten in the habit of having coffee every week, and we used to swap books back and forth. And in those days, I was interested in books mainly for their stylistic excellence. Mm -hmm. If I got a great narrative voice, I didn't really care what the book was about. So my friend hands me Surprised by Joy, and just he's a soft sell guy. And so he just says, I think you'll like this. Great narrative voice. This is, this is up your street. Try Had you been surprised out. by Joy at that point? No, I hadn't read any of Lewis at all. Okay. He's just, just a name. Okay. And so he hands me surprised by Joy and says, I, I think you'll like this. Okay. So, and, and of course, Lewis says in Surprised by Joy, God is very unscrupulous. And so sometimes our friends are very unscrupulous too. So he hands me this book and I take it home and I read it and I thought, wow, this is, this is really quite something, isn't it? So we had coffee the next week and I said, hey, this Lewis guy, what else has he written? Small end of the wedge, right? And so he hands me a copy of The Case for Christianity, which ultimately became the first part of mere Christianity. And I took that home and that was what did it. That was the avalanche. Um, I started nodding about on page four and anybody who's read Lewis's apologetics know that his mind works like a fine cutting tool, paring away the absolute down to the absolute essential kernel of hard truth in the center. And so you find yourself A to B, B to C, C to D. So I was reading The Case for Christianity. I'm nodding my head on page four. And I was one of those lazy agnostics that had kind of drifted that he talks about in Mere Christianity. So I'm nodding my head page four. I'm nodding my head page eight. OK, A to B, got that. B to C, got that. C to D, got that. And I get to page 20. And I've, I'm at the end of this change of reasoning. And I'm going, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Oh. Right. And so then you get to that point where you say to yourself, are we going to connect thinking with doing or are we just going to think? Yeah. And so then I went to screw tape and I read all of Lewis. Um, and the way this book came about. But let me just break up, yes. break in for a moment. Sure. Uh, so connecting thinking and doing. Uh, what did you think about God before reading that and how did that change your thinking? I hadn't thought a whole lot, actually. That was the thing. Okay. I was just that, that lazy agnostic that came from a, a, a very loving, very giving, kind of non-denominational Christian family, and I was the inquisitive child in a family of not overly inquisitive people. And so I was one of those kids that would say, how come this and why that and why doesn't God? And, and I used to get the kind of because God said so answers. And so I just stopped asking those questions. And then of course when I was in, uh, when I was in the, the prep school environment, there was nobody there asking those kinds of questions. And so it just dropped off the radar screen. It wasn't, it wasn't a conscious rebellion, it was just a drift. And then I just, and then finally, when I, when I finally read Lewis, uh, when I finally went to mere Christianity, I got to the end and I thought, like I thought with Jaber Crow, I thought, why didn't anybody place this in my hands before? Where, where, where was the person who should have given me this book? This is, this is, this is everything I, was, I needed. This is what, this, the, this is true. I know this is true. So then at, the, at that point, uh, uh, did you, how, how did you turn thinking into doing? Did you uh, start going to church? Did you, what, what happened? Well, the first thing I did was I started prayer. And I started thinking about 
not just understanding my relationship to God, but what my obligations were. And then I started thinking, okay, everybody's been given some abilities. And so what, what, am, what are my abilities? What, what can I do? How can I serve? We all have a way that we can serve. How can I serve? And so over this period of time, I would just think about those kind of things. I would try to live by Christian principles. I would try not to judge other people. I would catch myself doing that kind of thing. And I'd think, well, you gotta... It, it's very interesting that when you progress along the road of the spiritual life, you have those moments when you know that you've progressed because the road in front of you looks longer and the road behind you looks darker. And so I had many moments like that where I looked back and thought, wow, that was, that was a pretty, pretty dark, ugly place I started in. Um, so I, I think that was the thing. I think prayer was the biggest thing for me because I've, I've discovered that the more that I um, engage in prayer, the more, the more revelation that I come to. I, I, uh, I ask for the things like clarity of thought. I asked for finding my purpose. I asked for finding an apostolate. How can I serve? What can I do? Other than the ordinary things that you would do, volunteering there, what can I do? And I think this book is the answer to those years of asking what I could do. Well, let's turn to this book. This is, uh, again, this is just out uh, and, and 70 years. This is the 70th anniversary of the Screw Tape Letters, first published in 1942. So I've waited a long time. And let me ask you to read several passages from this, sure. starting with the one on pages 9 and 10, where there is a, uh, well, it's a concern, it's a graduate student in English. Yes. Um, this is the beginning of letter three. Uh, it concerns academia. Uh, the protagonist, the, uh, the younger uh, devil is Scar Dagger, and the elder is Slash Reap. And so this is how letter three begins. My dear Scar Dagger, we shall now begin the task of satisfying your ever-growing hunger. A client has been selected for you by the low command. She is a postgraduate in the English department of an old and prestigious university, which means, happily for us, a hotbed of arrogance, spiritual erosion, and social vanity. She is quite clever by human standards, which could work very much in our favor, as her environment is perfectly suited to inflame her latent intellectual snobbery and many of the other lovely vices which we are trying to make endemic. We must consider how best to exploit her aspirations. She has set her sights on a career in academia. Do we want to propel her to dizzy heights of academic success, distending her ego and making her a loathsome prig to everyone but her most accomplished colleagues, wallowing in the envy she provokes in her peers and the fear she instills in her students? Or shall we raise her just to the level of mediocrity that will cause her to aspire to, but never to reach those dizzying heights? An onlooker who stokes her hunger by publishing a few books here and there, but is mostly ignored by the academic community, and who spends her life picking at the scabs of envy that will form on her like a spiritual crust, never noticing the redeeming presence of the few eager students that could become her friends? Shall we degrade her still further, dash all her hopes, and guide her to the endless drudgery of teaching grammar school English? slowly grinding her into a dust of disappointment and resentment, blinding her to the fact that it is there, were her motivations pure, that she might actually do the most good by inviting young minds as yet unformed to the great feast of literature, which she once enjoyed before books became the building blocks of her ambition? There is no need to decide the issue at once, but do keep it in mind. Why did you choose an ac uh, setting in academia as opposed to C.S. Lewis uh, had uh, a, a person not actually associated with colleges, why? Uh, I think that I had certain access to grind with academia. <laughs> Sounds like it. Yeah. Uh, and I was also inspired by the fact that Lewis himself had certain access to grind with academia. Um, Lewis, when he was at Oxford, everybody who knew Lewis kn knew that Lewis was the great man at Oxford in his generation, which was saying quite a bit, because there were a great many great men in Oxford in those years. Lewis was the most popular lecturer in the university, all of his lectures were standing room only. All of his sermons were standing room only, which is one of the reasons he stopped giving them because uh, every, after every sermon, people would pat him on the back and tell him what a fine fellow he was. And one day he said to one of them, you know, I think I'm gonna stop doing this because if everybody keeps telling me what a fine fellow I am, I might start to believe it. Um, but he was easily the most popular, the most famous, and the biggest selling author as far as his books went 
in the university. And three times he was passed over for a professorship when he was easily the most qualified candidate. And he was passed over, and we see it in a letter from his friend J.R.R. Tolkien, we see that he was passed over simply because of jealousy, that the, other, that the other dons were jealous of his success, jealous of his fame, jealous of his genius. It can be a very toxic environment, the university setting. Right, so he came to realize that everything is by grace, I mean, surprised by joy, Absolutely. and so forth. Uh, and so he, I can see that, he was very much against the, the arrogance and hubris and reflects that. Let's, let's go to another section. This is on pages uh, 14 and 15. I asked you to read that. This is concerning a 19th century businessman and so forth. Yes, yes. Um, this, this touches, this is the first letter that touches on the problem of pain. Perhaps an illustration is in order. I once had for a pupil a young tempter named Itchgrit. His first client was Easy Game, he thought, handed to him on a plate, a captain of industry, as we called them then, who rode to tremendous wealth, thanks to me, on the sweat of underpaid labor. His workers lived in squalor, usually hungry, often cold, in housing he provided at ruinous rates. There was nowhere else for this people to live because he owned the town as well. The mortality rate among the children in this company town was hellishly high and even brought me a special commendation. Falso the adversary never entered the client's head. No luxury was too good for him, hand-tailored suits by the hundred, jewelry for his mistress, provided by us, a house so grotesquely large that it was often mistaken for a hotel, and all the other useless trimmings of his time and class. When challenged by men of conscience, he merely laughed off the adversary as medieval superstition, unfit for a modern, enlightened, 19th century man. Then, the adversary attacked our flank, prostrating the client for the first time in his life, and I watched my decades of work crumble to the ground. Itchgrit had become so accustomed to spending his time at the client's side, it was, after all, terribly amusing, that he had virtually forgotten the client's little boy the apple of his eye, and, due to his wife's infirmity, his only child. The adversary did not forget, but was only biding his time to make Itchgrit's failure more spectacular. The adversary struck the child with scarlet fever. The client, to my disgust, on hearing the diagnosis, dropped to his knees in prayer for the first time in his life, and with a swiftness that almost made his hips crack. He promised the adversary that if his child recovered, he would devote himself to the adversary's service. Now, the adversary does not, as a rule, make bargains, as some humans believe. But unfortunately, the client's penitence was not idle claptrap to be forgotten when the child recovered, and as we would have gladly believed it to be. He had offered the adversary the thing the adversary likes best, a genuine act of contrition. Now. When the client looked into the eyes of a child that was sick or weak with hunger, he saw his own child. He had learned the loathsome skill of empathy. His boy recovered, but just barely, and was thereafter stone deaf. The deafness was Itchgrit's contribution, a final gambit in the hope of provoking the client's anger against the adversary. Instead, it proved the final gasp of defeat. The client had been accustomed to doing as he pleased, regardless of public opinion. The adversary turned this habit of mind against us. To the astonishment, bewilderment, and even resentment of his own class, the client converted his home into a hospital for children and founded a school for the deaf which he endowed in perpetuity and which, alas, flourishes to this day despite our efforts. So you see, even the best material is subject to the adversary's attack. Itchgrit is now housed in quarters intended for his client. I trust you will see the lesson. With warm regards from your loving uncle and mentor, Slash Reap. So the 19th century businessman had a kind of lazy agnosticism, perhaps similar to, to yours. And, yes, and, there, and there is a commonality. Yeah, yeah. So the problem of pain, certainly that occupied Lewis, occupies many, it's one of the key things. And, and there's another passage uh, just a couple of pages later on where you go into that further. Mm -hmm. Why don't you read that? Yes, this is the middle of letter five. You know the kind of thing. If the adversary exists, why do bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people? Or better still, if the adversary is all loving, all seeing, and all powerful, um, unfortunately, all really effective lies must have a tincture of truth. 
Why is there suffering? You would think that the life of the adversary himself, when he appeared on earth, would at least have taught them that a long life and a pleasant death are not a reward for good behavior. Huh. First, to consider the presence of pain at all. The question is one of perspective, which you as a youngster will find difficult to see, because our purpose differs so much from the adversaries. We want sheep fattened for slaughter. A life of ease, sensuality, comfort, and mindless dissipation would suit us admirably. He wants immortal beings united to him, freely, joyously, eternally. Uh, pardon the distasteful phraseology, a teacher must be candid. Humans are designed and required to grow and learn, and ultimately to serve, not because they have been placed under the lash, as we would have it, but because their will freely conforms to his. In order to learn, they must act, and he has given them a dangerous world because it is only in a world of danger, and thus pain, that moral issues come to the surface. In a dangerous world, a human learns that actions have consequences. Thus, the adversary does not will pain, but accepts it as a natural and necessary consequence of the world he has made. This may surprise you, but there are many things he permits yet does not will, as when a father teaches his child to ride a bicycle, not wishing the child ever to fall and skin his knees, but knowing that falling is a natural consequence of the attempt to ride and thinking the pain worth the reward. The child, who has the reward in sight, is also willing to endure the pain, even when it becomes irrefutably real after he takes his first fall. The analogy may be carried still further. Any parent with the slightest foothold in the adversary's camp will claim, quite correctly, I'm afraid, that the child's fall hurts the parent more than the child. Very few children refuse the freedom offered by their first bicycle simply to avoid the pain. Once they have learned to ride, their knees heal, their pain is forgotten, and they are left with the skill from which they may forever profit. And so it is with the world he has given them. They skin their knees, sometimes to our delight, quite badly. He picks them up. He allows some to be desperately ill and suffer almost unendurable pain, making it difficult for them to see beyond the moment they are in. But even these humans usually find, if they appeal to him, that he never asks them to go it alone. Those that apply to him for help nearly always get it, even if they cannot see it at the time, because they are only thinking of the present. He is thinking of forever. Keep this in mind. The adversary sees the tempered steel they are to be once they emerge from the furnace. The clients who learn to ride in the toughest schools of all, in the end, will be the most free. It is therefore of paramount importance to prevent our clients from adopting the adversary's perspective. The world is a kind of dress rehearsal. The real show is on the other side of death. You must keep this horrible truth from your client at all costs. Teach her that the only reality is under her pretty nose. Human blindness can be very advantageous to us. The suffering of others has the added disadvantage of taking the humans perilously out of themselves and focusing their attention on the needs of the other, which is exactly the habit of mind the adversary is trying to produce. And what? is the first thought that occurs to any human when confronted with someone we have successfully crippled and deformed? Gratitude, my dear Skardagger. Gratitude that it is not they who have been so stricken, even if their muddle-headedness prevents them from recognizing to whom they are offering their gratitude. So it's very Lewis-like uh, in tone and substance. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Uh, let me ask you to read one more. Now, this is, an, this is a, a question, the, the problem of pain, that every generation has to has to deal with. But you also bring in some things here that Lewis did not have to deal with in this way. Yes. And so there's a passage about, uh, well, basically concerning the gay rights agenda and right. so forth. Uh, mm -hmm. Why don't you read that? Yes, this is from letter 12, about halfway through. This letter is on political correctness in general. And so this serves as an illustration of what political correctness is doing to our uh, public discourse. We see an even finer example of our philological handiwork in the representation of homosexuality. It is no longer a misfortune which should elicit the natural sympathy and charity of those not afflicted, as the adversary would have it. It is, after all, not a sin, but a cross. From the adversary's point of view, the homosexual is no different from the glutton, the adulterer, the liar, or the worshiper of graven images with which we have peopled the stock exchanges. 
Like any other temptation, homosexuality only becomes a sin at the consummation of the desire. Until then, it is merely a cross. Either way, it is the legitimate object of prayer and penitence for the homosexual and of prayer and charity for the heterosexual. The homosexual is in exactly the same position as the unmarried heterosexual, though we have masked this fact with the sexual revolution. The adversary's command is to enjoy the physical union he has designed only through the sacrament of marriage. Otherwise, he commands abstinence, which, thanks to us, is virtually impossible for them. We have made homosexuality a valid alternative lifestyle. And the promulgation of this absurdity introduces a good, solid lie at the center of this so-called lifestyle, while eroding whatever legitimate sympathy the homosexual might have elicited from others. We have corrupted the homosexual's legitimate plea for tolerance, turning it into a demand, at first for acceptance and then for approval. We have thus shifted the response in the heterosexual from charity and sympathy to incredulous disbelief and sometimes laughter, for even the most cursory knowledge of biology would convince anyone, except those with a real talent for self-deception, that the homosexual is trying to run the machine the wrong way. By placing the valid alternative lifestyle lie at the core of the homosexual's beliefs, prompting them to demand that it be accepted as unconditional truth, and teaching them to scorn the prayers of those who would wish them well, uh, they are well already, we drive a wedge between them and heterosexuals who would never have bothered about them at all, or would have gladly befriended them, and fan the hatred of heterosexuals who would deem the homosexuals' cross an abomination. This triumphant transition has borne even sweeter fruit. The ultimate advantage to us is not societal strife and division in the church, however amusing, but spreading ever wider our finest work, the one dearest to his majesty's dark heart, spiritual pride. Homosexuality is a mere sin of the flesh. The creation of homosexuals is a legitimate goal for us, not so that we may damn them, but so that we may ensnare those tasty delicacies, these spiritually self-righteous souls who are protected from this particular sin, yet who would denigrate those who have this cross to bear. You have no doubt noticed uh, that the most vociferous claims to superiority in any society are made by the subliterate, the uneducated, and the intellectually deficient. The goal is to make them so busy indulging their self-righteous outrage over this abomination that they forget the prayer they are under orders to utter every day. The central image, and for the thoughtful human, the most terrifying in the adversary's prayer, uh, the one he taught them himself, is the plea to forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. That is, forgive us in the same way and to the same degree that we forgive others. You would think even the meanest intellect among the heterosexuals could not miss the lesson. Yet, tens of thousands would willingly cast the homosexual into the pit with us, never seeing the other end of the heavy chain which clasps them by the ankle and will drag them down together. In His Majesty's house are many mansions too. Political correctness gives us the advantage of inflaming hypersensitivities of every kind, neutralizing charity, and diverting human attention from realities which should cause them real dismay, and ultimately, if all goes well, reducing issues of spiritual life and death to semantics, etymology, and catchphrases. With warm regards from your loving uncle and mentor, Slash Reap. Have you seen Max McCombs? Uh, I have. Edition of Screw Tape Letters, yes. <laughs> and of course, uh, Max and uh, you know, affectionately are Screw Tape. So you have to be working on the, on the, on the side. <laughs> well, I, I hope not to be the one that's standing on the stage doing it myself. <laughs> so, well, um, Richard uh, also very kindly has brought thirty copies of this this excellent new book that he has donated to the bookstore, right, to the college. And so, any of you can do that, and thus. You can, if you, if you were actually walking down the street, you know, there was a famous uh, uh, music video in 1995, I think, uh, with Bono. Uh, and I'll have to check the indicator. Yeah, uh, hold me, thrill me, kill me, ki hold me, thrill me, kiss me, kill me. And Bono in that music video is walking down the street holding a copy of the Screw Tape Letters. Mm -hmm. So perhaps those of you who find this interesting, 
uh, can go to the bookstore and buy a copy, and perhaps there'll be someone videotaping you as you walk down the street, and perhaps you'll become famous in that way. So you can help, but right now you can help by asking Richard questions. Comments, thoughts, anyone? What appeals to you, what doesn't appeal to you, or even what, you, what you've learned from C.S. Lewis over the years? Mr. Platt, <clears throat> uh, thanks for coming. Uh, listening to you read from your book, uh, it's a very striking narrative voice. One would think that you're a brilliant uh, observer of the human condition. Uh, but in our conversation earlier, you were describing how this book came to you, and I uh, haven't heard you dis discuss that here in depth. Could you describe how you came upon this whole project? Sure. Um, I, I, didn't, I didn't choose to write this book. It chose me. Um, it came to me, I would say, by the grace of God, just like everything else that's worthwhile in our lives comes to us. Um, it came, it started on the first week of October uh, 2009. It was after dinner. I was having a cup of tea, one of those life is good moments where you're staring out the window with your feet up thinking that everything's going rather well for you. In San Diego, this would make a tea commercial by the Pacific Ocean. And right, so just looking at it. It might have even been raining that night, which is something very unusual for us. So we learned to think of rain as, a, as, a, as an entertainment. And so I was staring out the window, and it, and it occurred to me that there were a great many things in this world in need of what you might call scrutapian treatment. Topics presented themselves. And then I started thinking, what would a modern scrutapian voice sound like? Because Screwtape's voice is not constant over the years. The original Screwtape letters were written in 1941, published in book form 1942. And then there was an extended essay, Screwtape Proposes a Toast, published in 1960. And if you read the two, you will see that the narrative voice has changed. Lewis is becoming more distressed, he's angrier, and you can tell that what he is distressed about is this abyss of moral relativism that the world is spiraling into. And so I thought, what would a modern screw tape voice sound like if you took the trajectory of that from 1941 to 1960 and you extended it 50 years into the future, what would that sound like? And I decided it would be more shrill, that the knife would go in a little harder and twist a little bit uh, more deeply. And so then I started thinking, okay, what would that really sound like? And then I started actually to hear it, like you would hear a familiar tune or I think we've all had that kind of experience where you're, uh, you're with a friend, the friend whistles a tune or sings a bit of a tune, and you say, oh, don't do that, now I'm gonna have that tune in my head all day. So it was one of those kind of things where I was just hearing this tune, I was hearing what this narrative voice would sound like. And so I listened to it for a little bit, and then I sudden, suddenly realized that I was not creating this sound. I was, I, was, I was hearing it, I was receiving it, but I wasn't making it up, which is a very strange experience. And so I just sat there and listened to it for a while, and I thought, okay, well, this is odd, but there are odd things in this world. So my wife and I spent that evening together, and having been together for so long, my wife is used to having my undivided attention. And so this was one of the few nights in our married life where she did not have my undivided attention because there were three of us in the room. And so we're, we're talking, and at the same time we're talking, I'm still hearing this voice in my head. So I went to bed that night, couldn't sleep, stared at the ceiling all night, and the voice kept going over and over. Got up the next day, exhausted. Heard the voice all the next day, couldn't sleep the next night, woke up the next day, and I'm still hearing this voice. And I'm thinking, this is nutty, but I've gotta do something about this because if I don't do something about this, this is gonna make me crazy. And so I realized that I had been praying for an apostolate for quite some time. And I realized that God talks to us, I think, all the time, but we're not always paying attention. And I thought, maybe I'm not paying attention here. Maybe I should be doing something instead of sitting here whining about this voice in my head. So I tried to resist it, and I couldn't. And then I sat down, and I started just to write out what I was hearing. And that was when it really started. Uh, the floodgates opened, and then I couldn't stop. And I had 3,500 words, the first three letters, even before I knew what I was doing. And then I took a rest, and it started again. And I got to the end of the day, and I was, I was really worn out. Um, and I thought, well, it can't get any nuttier. And so, obviously, this, there's something that's talking to me, so maybe I can talk to it. And so I just said to it, look, I really want to do this. I'm willing to do this. I'll do this every day. I'll do this for as long as it takes. If that's what you want me to do, I'll do it. But I have to rest. I'm really tired. And if you'll let me rest just a little bit, we can, we can do this better. I can, I can do this better. And so then it just kind of quieted down. Didn't go away. 
but it just, the volume just went down. I went to bed, I got a good night's sleep, and then the next morning before I, could open, before I opened my eyes, it started again, and it was loud. And so I got up, made the coffee, grabbed the dog out to the library, and wrote. And I did that every day for 35 days until it was finished. And it was an interesting experience because it showed me certain things about receiving an apostolate, which I think are good things to know. Um, one is that God doesn't give you the whole picture now. He gives you the part that you need to know now. And I think that there are three reasons for that. The first is that if you saw the whole picture from where you are now, you probably wouldn't understand it anyway. And if there are, say, 10 things that you need to do in sequence, it simply doesn't make any sense for you to hear number seven when you're at number two. And I think the biggest reason for that is that uh, if God actually gave you the whole picture, you'd be so scared that you probably wouldn't do anything at all. And the other thing that I recalled in this writing is that I was reminded of something that I've, I've seen both in Lewis and in George MacDonald, is that faith is the thing that sustains you and it sustains the things that you have come to by reason in a time of fear. Because there were a couple of times in writing this book that I grew very fearful. One day was when I sat down, I was about letter 22 or 23, I sat down to write, just as I'd been doing every day, and the voice wasn't there. And I started having these fearful thoughts. I started thinking, should I have been writing faster? Should I have worked harder? Should I have started sooner? Did I do something wrong? What's going on? And then I thought, no, don't worry about that. That's the part that God worries about. The part that you worry about is, is being here ready to receive it. That's your job. And so I just sat, and I read through what I'd written the day before and the day before, and I changed a little syntax, corrected some punctuation, and then it started again. And uh, the other thing, the, the time that, that faith sustained me in the face of fear was a much graver uh, incident because as I got to the end, I started thinking about the responsibility of what was being handed to me. And that was, that was a, a, real, a real moment of, of crisis for me because I thought, when I actually stopped to think about what I was doing, and it's always better just to obey rather than to think too much, because then you get too far ahead. And so I lost, I lost the thread, I lost the focus of simple obedience. And I started thinking, what is it you're exactly you're trying to do here? Okay. You're trying to write a book that is in some way, however modest a way, worthy of the legacy of the man that you revere above all other men. And you are trying to do it in such a way that you are copying his narrative voice, the narrative voice of the man that you regard as the great man of letters of the 20th century. And who are you to be doing this exactly? And then I thought, when I actually show this to people, what are they gonna, what, what's this going to look like? Um, I mean, when I show it to people, they're going to think one of two things. They're going to think it's either an, an act of extreme folly, or they're going to think it's an act of world-class arrogance. And that shook me up a little, but I thought, that's down the road. Let's just get this done now. You're supposed to do something now. Don't worry about what people are going to say. You just, you've been given a job. Just do it, and you'll figure it out later on. And so that's how I moved forward. Yeah. Questions, anyone? So C.S. Lewis had 31 chapters, you have 31 chapters. So. Yes, yes, actually that was um, one of the very, very helpful things. When I, when I started hearing the words, that was all I got, was the words, not the structure. And I think most people that write know that a, a blank piece of paper can be a pretty, pretty intimidating thing. And so I thought, well, I can go to Lewis for structure. In the same way that, say, a, a poet would go to an Elizabethan sonnet, if you wanted to write a poem mm. and you had structure, you would have certain parameters. So if you went to an Elizabethan sonnet, you'd say, okay, I'm going to write a poem. Let's see, what do we have here? 14 lines, iambic pentameter, A, B, A, B, C, D, C, D, E, F, E, F, couplet at the end. Okay, that's the format. So that's a template. I can work with that. So now some of my work is done. So that's what I did. I went back to screw tape, and I thought, okay, let's, let's see how the machine returns. Let's see how the master did this. How did he do it? He did it in 31 letters. He did it a thousand words per letter. He gave us only one side of the correspondence. You never hear from the junior tempter, but what the junior tempter says and does is implicit in what the senior tempter says in the letter. Then you also have a main character, the person that they are stalking, that has to appear all through the narrative, but never directly, mm. only obliquely. And then finally, each chapter, each letter, has to be able to stand alone as an independent essay, that each one has to deal with an independent topic, but there has to be a connecting narrative that unites them all. 
So once I had that, that gave me a bit of structure. And that, I think that's the, other than the narrative voice, that's the greatest debt that I owe to the original. He showed me, he showed me the pathway. He showed me how the machinery was supposed to work. Thank you for um, coming and sharing your story. I had a question. I remember reading once that C.S. Lewis talked about writing the screw tape letters, that after a while, speaking in the um, infernal voice, as it were, became very difficult for him, and just taking such a morally backwards view of, of the Christian life. And you spoke about a voice particularly, and how it was exhausting, but um, could you comment on kind of the moral quality of looking backwards and twisted? Yes. Yes, the, 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 the phrase that you're referring to uh, is in the, uh, the 1960 introduction uh, to Screw Tape with Screw Tape Proposes a Toast, where Lewis says that he had never written with greater ease, but never with less pleasure, and that in writing Screw Tape, it was all dust, grit, thirst, and itch. Um, I also wrote with extreme ease to the extent that I wrote. It felt like taking dictation, but it was very, very easy. The biggest problem was keeping up with it. Um, I will say that, actually, I enjoyed myself enormously. Um, what that says about me, it's probably best not to speculate. <laughs> but I, I just, I had, I had a grand time doing it. Thanks for being with us. Um, one of the things that strikes me about satire is that it requires, true satire, not just parody, it requires a society that has some common sense of standards that are being deviated from. Um, so my question for you is, who is the audience for your book and do you feel they have that sense of um, certain standards or in our modern society, that seems very problematic. I think the audience will be the same audience that Screwtape found. I think the audience is pretty wide ranging. I think there will be people who read it because they find it instructive or enlightening. I think there will be, there will be people who read it and will be outraged and give it to their friends who will be equally outraged. But at least it will provoke dialogue. And I hope it does provoke dialogue rather than invective. Um, there were a few people who saw the book in manuscript that took offense to certain passages. And I find that curiously consoling because it means that you've hit the mark. When you're writing a book like this, uh, when you catch people engaged in some bit of nonsense they're engaged in and you call them to account for it, they almost always respond with anger or invective because as Lewis said in Screw Tape, hatred has its pleasures. But when you're caught doing something that you really should be a little embarrassed about, you have two options. You can either deny it and then respond with self-righteous anger, or you can admit to it. But if you admit to it, that's no fun, because that involves contrition, reformation, and penitence. Those things are no fun at all. So I, I think that the, the book's audience will be quite wide-ranging. I'm hoping it will be, and for vastly different reasons. And what I'm really hoping, most of all, is that since Lewis has meant so much to me, I am really hoping that people that have never been acquainted with Lewis will read it and go, huh, I wonder what the original one was like, and that they'll go to back, back to Lewis. And I think that I would consider the book a great success the day that I receive a letter from someone that says to me, I read your book, and as a consequence, I read Lewis for the first time. And as a consequence of that, my life has been changed. I think if I received one letter like that, that it's made a difference to one person's life, it would be worth writing in that. And that's, I would consider that the ultimate accolade. So I suspect the passage on homosexuality upset both those who think it's fine and also those who think it's the worst of all, of all sins. Right. Well, what, what are, give us an example, give us another passage that, uh, that upset folks. Well, there were some academic passages that my academic friends were upset about. Okay. Um, and, and basically, what, every time I, I came upon somebody that, that was bothered by one of the passages, I would just say to them, quote me the passage that isn't true. You, you re read me the passage that's not true and tell me why it's not true. And if you can convince me that it's not true, I'll delete it or I'll rewrite it. I mean, the book was in manuscript. I could have changed anything I wanted to. Um, and there was only one thing that was changed. Um, my friend, the Presbyterian minister who introduced me to Lewis, 
uh, I, I gave the book to him and I gave the book to an Anglican uh, uh, minister to read to check my theology. And one of them came back with two paragraphs and he said, now this paragraph here, this is good Platonism, but it's not quite good Christianity. And I said, great, I mean, constructive criticism, great. Invective, I'm not so crazy about, but constructive criticism, fine. And so I said, okay, well, explain to me what's wrong with that. And he did, and I said, okay. And so we just sat down right there and I rewrote the two paragraphs and I handed it to him and I said, how's that, that work? And he said, yeah, that works fine. Okay. So that's how we did that. Constructive criticism. Mm. Let's see, Great. question over here. I'm looking forward to reading your books. I'm wondering, uh, Lewis got the name Wormwood from Revelation, I believe. And I'm wondering where you came up with your names for your guys. They sound pretty, uh, pretty good. Um, I, again, I used uh, Lewis's uh, structure as a template. You will see that in Screwtape, all of the demonic characters are either uh, names of two or three syllables. Most of them are things where he took one word with an unpleasant association and split it and then attached it to a, the half of another word with a pleasant association. For example, you see screw tape and wormwood. And I just look at that and I suspect that what he did was he had wood screw and tapeworm. And he just cut them and, re and reassembled them. And so that's what I did. I took words that had unpleasant associations, itch grit, slash, reap, things like that. And I just experimented with the euphonious quality of each. I just, I had a list of probably 30 or 40 names and, and even more single syllables. And I just kind of juggled them around. And actually, slash reap was a last minute change. I decided that the original uh, name wasn't, wasn't euphonious enough for reading out loud. And so I, I changed it to make it a little easier on the tongue. And Calvin and Hobbes, the nasty teacher of Calvin is Miss Wormwood. <laughs> which, uh, which of your character names do you hope will become part of popular culture? Wow. Well, I, I, suppose, the, uh, I suppose the protagonist, Slash Reap, Slash Reap. I'm, I'm, I'm rather fond of that name. He could be the principal of a boarding school. Yeah, absolutely. And, 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 and Scar Dagger could easily be his assistant. Right. Yes, indeed. All right. Other questions? <laughs> we, have, we have maybe a couple minutes left if there's one last question, perhaps. So. Well, um, again, I, I, am, uh, I was thrilled to, uh, to read this book. I hope you'll take a look at it, uh, at it also. Um, and it's just a good example, really, of, uh, of finding calling. And if you had, if you had decided uh, 30 years ago that, gee, if you, if you, had, read, uh, if you read the screw tape letters and decided 30 years ago, I want to write a sequel to it, uh, wouldn't have been any good. No. No, it, it's, I've gone through quite a long period of uh, incubation. Yeah. Well, thank you, and we're glad that you were able to come here today. Please join me in thanking it's author It's been a great Richard pleasure. Black. Thank you for having me. Thank you. We do thank, do thank both author Richard Platt and Dr. Marvin Olasky for today's interview. Uh, thank you for our audience who joined us today and also for the perhaps 100 or so people who might be following us on webcast. And we'll be joined, of course, eventually in the printed version when roughly 400,000 readers of World Magazine also join in today's conversation. So that's a pleasure. Also, for those who are here and also uh, who are watching our live cast, uh, we will be having another interview in about 20 minutes with Congressman Frank Wolf. So stay tuned for that. And again, we give thanks to Mr. Platt. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you.